Monday afternoon workshop on problem solving. You are with Workplace Education Manitoba. I'm Carrie Holmes, and I'm so excited to be here today with you. I'll be in the, the back end of things, checking if anybody has tech issues or support, um, and know that the lovely and talented Rochelle Amy will be joining us in just a moment. I'm going to get you through this first part, and then we'll bring her in for the juicy stuff. Hi, Stacy. It's good to see you. Well, see your name. <laughs> So welcome everybody. Hop into the chat. Give us a shout out. Um, just above here we have, you know, you see above here the emojis. So you can shoot us an emoji as well. We love it all. It's a great way to interact, especially in this platform with the one way delivery. And Dana, thank you from Thompson, Sandra from the Paw, from Carmen, Manitoba. This is awesome. I'm joining you from the middle of nowhere, so I'm hoping that my internet holds. Thinking internet, hey, <laughs> living and loving. Morden, thanks, Corey. I love finding out where you're joining from and all of that stuff. It's a great way to connect and also for us to recognize um, the reach we can have throughout the province. So today, just to give you an idea where we're headed, we're looking at considering the different processes and strategies for solving problems. We know that we are all unique, special unicorns. We also know that we learn in different ways, we think in different ways, and you got it, we communicate in different ways. So today, looking at a variety of different um, strategies for solving problems and finding the one that works best for you. And I bet as we go through this, Rochelle will give us a lot of great ideas and tips and strategies and be able to look at not only the strategies, but also how they apply to different problems that we may have, right? So it's not a one size fits all. We'll also um, keep sight of the variables at play. Like I said, there's a lot of different things that come into play when we're solving problems. Is this a solo adventure? Are we working in teams? Who's responsible at the end of the day? And to be able to look at some of those, those different variables that we'll come across in the workplace. As a reminder, we do this every session, um, <laughs> and it helps us to connect with the work that we do as well. We're helping people to develop essential skills that are needed for work, learning, and life. Yes, I'm a broken record, but it's the total truth that each one of these sessions that we provide for you, um, I hope anyway, I hope that you can see how they apply in all those different areas. <clears throat> Ooh, got excited, guys. Here we are, Workplace Education and Skills Training Centers. I'm going to land on the slide for a second and take a look at the one that would be closest to you. So we, today, we are joining you from the West Center in the Interlake, which is located in beautiful Selkirk. I'm so choked up just thinking about it. Actually, guys, I'm having a coughing attack, and that's why you lost sound for a bit. Anyway, I just wanted to remind you, um, for those of you that you know are close to us here in Selkirk, this is where we are at. We just moved last summer um, to this location here across from the Gaynor library yes <laughs> might be pulling Rochelle here in just a second a little sooner than we had anticipated um let's see the nine essential skills thanks everybody for your patience by the way so we talk about the nine essential skills at WEM this is the land we live in all the time and so as we go through our session today perhaps you'll be able to recognize how these essential skills fit in with problem solving oral communication thinking reading continuous learning, document use, computer use, writing, working with others, and numeracy. So the ones that really pop out to me would be definitely thinking, <laughs> working with others, oral communication, and continuous learning. That's what you're here um, doing today. Now, those other ones definitely fit in, but these are the ones that really pop out. Now, as you know, this training has been funded. So we are able to provide this at no cost to you. Um, thank you to Employment and Social Development Canada and Manitoba Education and Training. And this 
project was jointly funded through Human Resources Skills Development Canada and Entrepreneurship Training and Trade. And if you would like more information, um, we do customized training. We have our West Center, those pictures that I just showed you and was coughing over, um, and also personalized training in your workplace. You know, you can visit our website here. It's listed wem.mb.ca and hook you up with the regional coordinator for your area that can help you with this type of training. You can come into your workplace virtually currently um, and hopefully in person very soon. And so we have a lot of different options for the training that we provide. For example, this session today we will be able we would be able to bring that into your organization and customize it so that it fits with the the, the type of training that you would need but also for your people now before we get started we have a little survey for you i invite you to click on the link that i've posted into the chat it will open up into a new window for you and go ahead and complete that. I'll be still for a moment and give you a few, a few seconds here to go ahead and complete the training. Thank, thank you for those of you that have completed the survey. We'll just give a few more minutes for the um, remainder of you to finish up. You are all amazing and deserve 500,000 points for filling out that survey. It really helps us um, understand where we're at and, and at the end, spoiler alert, we will do another one just to see, you know, how brilliant we've become throughout our time with Rochelle. So speaking of, um, I'll invite Rochelle here in just a moment to let you know a little bit about Rochelle. She is amazing, number one. And second, uh, she is a continuous learner herself. And so if we take back to those nine essential skills, Michelle's ticking the box there with continuous learning as she works on her master's in leadership. We're so thankful that she does that and is willing to share her brilliance with us, the little gems that she's picked up along the way. Michelle's been in a teaching capacity for <coughs> that many years and I'm grateful that she's able to, again, share that talent and skill with us. So Michelle, we'll bring you in leading us through our problem-solving workshop today 
And if anybody has any other issues or anything, let us know through that attendee chat. Take it away, Rochelle. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess it's afternoon now, but it's so sunny where I am in beautiful Selkirk. It feels like morning. Great to see you. Thank you, Carrie, for that lovely intro. Thank you, everyone, for being here, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You were all here ready to roll at the starting time, and we sure appreciate that. You solved one problem today. You cleared your schedule and set some time aside to do some training. How awesome are you? Send your boss an email and tell them how great you are. I would if I could. <laughs> Today, as we talk about problem solving, I always come into it with a spirit of optimism. In fact, our tidbit tomorrow is about positivity. <laughs> and I'm glad I get to talk about that because this is, um, this is not necessarily a word of inspiration about how I always feel, but this is where I always try to get to. Just recognizing that the problems we face in the workplace really are a gift because they help us develop, innovate, mature, and connect with the people that we work with. Now, as we go through today, um, initially I had this rubric laid out for you and um, I took some, some consideration of the last group that I worked with problem solving on and they really wanted to camp out in new techniques. They wanted to add to their skill set. So today we will spend the time doing some self-assessments and understanding our own thinking skills, but then we're gonna camp out for a little while in some of the problem solving techniques and you're going to be able to try them and work on them. Now with a thumbs up emoji, how many of you lead some sort of team? You're responsible for gathering one or more employees where you work on projects, problems, opportunities together. Are you in a supervisor kind of role where you get to influence others? We have, we have someone like that, we have a couple of us. So one of the interesting things is that um, when we get to the different types of strategies we can use for solving problems, they're kind of fun tools to bring to a team. So you can, plan a meeting to just use one of the rubrics to try to work through one of the problems. And then at the next meeting, you could choose the same problem or a different one and use a different rubric. And you'll find like the fireworks go off in the way people's brains are wired on your team. We'll talk a little bit about risks, but really um, explore those new strategies that we want to work through and expose our team to also. Now, just one note about that. When we're thinking about new strategies, we can also look at these. This is your little like free tip here. <laughs> these also make great reports. So if you have to report on your work or report on problem assessments, your, your hashtag freebie here is that you can use these problem solving strategies to help you write a report for the workplace, especially if you have to evaluate a program or document an error. These are great ways to beef up your report, report writing skills also. Now, how about thumbs up or thumbs down emoji? If you have your workbook printed out, show me your thumbs up emoji. If you do not have it printed out, show me your thumbs down emoji so that we know what we're working with here. Oh, you guys are amazing. Okay, so many of you have it printed. We have a, don't feel ashamed. You can show me a thumbs down emoji if you don't have it printed, that's okay. <laughs> For those of you who didn't answer. <laughs> So this workbook that Carrie's popped into the chat, thank you, Carrie. Um, that's something that if you need to keep that open digitally in another tab, you could always refer to the questions and then jot it down on a piece of paper as we work through. Now, I want to invite you to look at page four at the very top of your workbook. We do ask the question, what are some of the barriers to effective problem solving? Now, before you jump in, I know you're eager to write and do things. Notice that right ahead of that on page three, there was a definition about pro problem solving. And it says, the process of finding solutions to difficult or complex issues. Funny, because we usually think problem solving means the solution, correct? really problem solving is about the process, the part in the middle on how we get to the solution, 
So today is looking at process and saying, okay, it's one thing to identify a problem, it's another to answer it, but what happens in the middle? And when we get the middle right, not only can we reduce our own stress and anxiety and risk in the workplace, but we sometimes can really strengthen peer relationships on a team because we see that we're all working with a, a planned path and a calculated risk. So knowing that, it involves um, yourself and the people you work with and, of course, the impediments at hand. Go ahead and jot down for me in your workbook some of the barriers you find to effective problem solving. I'll give you a, a little bit to jot those down. And then if you could choose one and pop that into the chat for us, please. Go ahead and share some of your thoughts on potential barriers, just as Jody has. See, you guys have dealt with barriers. Absolutely. So thank you, Jody, for sharing that because um, the time crunch is absolutely a huge barrier and often one of the first barriers we face. In fact, sometimes before we even fully understand what the problem is, we're already on a clock thinking, I don't have time to solve this or how much time do I have to solve this? Um, and if we think of a couple workplace scenarios connected to time being a barrier, think about working in a drive through right? There's the clock running on how long someone's sitting in the drive through waiting for their order. So the first barrier is always what's clicking on that clock. We need to stop the clock is the first thing before anyone even knows what the problem is. Corey shares lack of information. Thank you, absolutely. Because often don't we get um, the problem or the problems created even sometimes because there was a lack of information shared or known. Um, I love these, uh, these, these thoughts here. We've always done it this way is, is often a barrier. And have any of you like showing me your emoji, have you ever heard that one at work, like, this is just the way it's done. <laughs> Don't question it. Or sometimes related to time, there's no time to question that. We don't have time for this. <laughs> we get that one a lot. And Sandra mentioning people not listening, absolutely, like, the people is the hardest part about working with people, I find. <laughs> and definitely egos get in into the into the way absolutely and we will talk a little bit about ego too because it's surprising that egos often attached 
um, with wealth and expertise in a particular role. And sometimes we, we can see it and sometimes we cannot. So these are really great. I hope you jotted down in your workbook some of the ones that some of your fellow learners shared today, um, because knowing what the potential barrier could be help keep, helps keep us in check when the problem is presented to us. So here's the problem with the problem. <laughs> we think that the problem is the problem. But usually all the extra emotions and all the extra drama that comes up in the background is showing us that sometimes the actual problem is no big deal. We need to fix a particular thing to accomplish something. We can do that no problem. But it triggers all these other mini problems attached to it. The interruption, as it were, might trigger a feeling that now someone has extra work to do because the problem wasn't on the to-do list today, right? I never have the problem on my to-do list. It might trigger a little bit of angst because we recognize that there's a decline in productivity. A disruption among staff because often problems involve humans and not just things. <laughs> so there could be a whole smoke screen going on about people's emotions and attitudes and so on. And then of course the poor customer relations, you know, one of the offshoots of having a problem is quickly damage control. How do we protect the customer in this? And of course we care about protecting the customer or the client because we care about the bottom line. So if we approach problems understanding that really um, the thing that's happening, the obstacle in our way, might have all these emotions attached to it and all this adrenaline attached to it. But if we can sort of recognize that, hey, there's a problem, but then there's these five or six underlying things underneath that it's touching the nerves of. It helps us recognize why certain humans that we're bumping into with the problem are feeling different things. So even different managers, it, you could almost categorize these sub problems into teams, right? You've got your production crew, you've got your HR people, you've got your frontline staff, the accountant, everybody's got skin in the game on needing to solve the problem. So I hope you jot those down in your workbook because this is a good way to, as you're discerning problems, to be able to figure out which one of these underlying tensions is charging the person who's filled with the adrenaline who's talking to me about the problem. It might be the customer themselves talking to you about the problem. And in their case, they're only in the customer relations tunnel. They don't care about the extra work it's causing you, right? So just knowing what sub problem category people are coming from. Now, this is where we get to take a good look in the mirror. <laughs> Before we go forward, we just want to pause and take a good look. So on page four, there is that nice chart with the yes, somewhat and no. And we want to take a few minutes and do this self assessment. So where it says, for example, I can identify the root cause of a problem you would be checking off either yes, somewhat, or no. So every line underneath gets one thing checked off in one of the columns. So go ahead and do that and then shoot me an emoji after you've given a little bit of thought to it. But hang on, it's a little more complicated than just the check mark. In the margin to the right, I also want you to give an example of when you do this. So where it says, I can identify the root cause of a problem. If you feel like you're really good at that, go ahead and check yes. And then just try to think, what was one of the recent things I saw? Now, a good example of that, if you're a parent is, let's go really basic. The baby is crying. Why is the baby crying? The baby's crying because they're hungry. So I know the root cause of the problem. So I might check yes, and then in the margin, put, um, you know, hunger pains was the issue or whatever. So just wanting you to pull your yes, somewhat and no's into context of the problems you've solved. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes on that and go ahead and work through that, please.
Now, likely you have been able to do the yes, somewhat, and no with your check marks. And um, you're probably about halfway through attaching some of the examples. So if you've been able to do the yes, somewhat, and no, maybe shoot me an emoji that we know you've got your check marks filling up the, the lines there. Excellent, excellent day. Now I want you to brag about yourself. So there's something here in this list that was an absolute yes. Probably something was a no, if I'm truly honest, I'm not good at that. <laughs> but in the yeses, why don't you tell me one of those things that you're actually pretty good at? Are you good at knowing the root cause? Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to send me an essay on whether you can prove that or not. I just wanna know, because we all have different starting points with coming in to tackle a problem. Are you a different solution thinker? Are you a really creative person that you can find different answers? Are you able to identify who's impacted? Go ahead and brag about yourself. And let's see a couple of you just, or all of you, um, put in which of the self-assessment ones was a quick yes. I'm gonna check mark the yes in that for sure. Let's see a couple more pop in. There's uh, one aspect of problem solving that kind of comes natural to you. This is amazing. Look at our answers, you guys. We would make a great team. Let's all just quit what we're doing and start a business because we all have a different first gut reaction skill, right? That's pretty cool. I'm loving it. It's so it's so cool because we all have um, we can learn all of these things and yet we bring in from our past experience some skills already. So, you know, I I shared there making a pro con list. I actually find that kind of fun, like literally to write it out and weigh the pros and cons. I just find it fun. I don't always follow the pro list because sometimes you have to make a decision knowing what some of the risks are. But I just find it fun to brainstorm all that. Jody, I love what you shared. Like that's using wisdom, right? Because you go back and figure out what worked before or what didn't work. And we can be stronger from that. And Stacy, you must be in all of our adaptability talks, right? We do so much, so much coaching here at WAM about adaptability and repositioning ourselves and being able to adjust your thinking is not easy to do. Uh, not only on a Monday morning can that be tough, but if you deal with recurring problems in the job, it can be hard to, to adjust and think about things from a new perspective. So that's a really great skill. And Corey, the, the key thing in moving forward is exactly what you identify and being able to know the root and to move forward from the root of a problem is so key. Sometimes under that time crunch, we have to deal with a symptom, right? We have to make a solution and make something go away before we can deal with the root. But this is why it's important to be able to come back and fix it so that it doesn't keep recurring. And then what Sandra shared, that wisdom again, in being able to look back at past problem solving experiences to find the solution. So maybe we've had similar experiences, but different problems. And so we can apply what's worked and move those into those future scenarios. Really, really cool that you have these, these abilities to pick out what your strong skills are and what you bring to the table. Because chances are the people on your team have complementary gifts at least we hope they do and if they don't find the people who do and draw them into the conversation too and this next part here just about looking at um, a bit of our 
our personal starting point, not just where our team's at, but what we're starting from, I want you to take a little bit of time with page five. The workbook here talks about personal development and it recognizes, like I've asked you, what's your natural strength or your learned strength? What is that? And maybe pull out one, two, three of them that you think are natural, learned, I'm experienced in those, I've got those. And maybe even outside of this workshop, that's something you can ask your your friends, your, your spouse or partner, your kids, you can ask colleagues, what do you think my strength is? Because they might see how you react in a really positive way every single time. And then at the bottom of page five, it's looking for where could we improve? Now, I won't ask you to expose yourself and share your weaknesses with us. That's for another workshop. <laughs> but that being, I just tell you that because I want you on page five at the bottom to be just brutally honest. There's, there's ones that we can improve. We might not be terrible at it, but we could still improve. So we're going to take a few more minutes this time. And just go ahead with, um, let's see, it's 1.35. I'm going to give you till about 1.39 to go ahead and do a little bit of PD planning on page five. Hey, thanks for doing that, everyone. One of your other free tips of the day, your hashtag free tip number two, <laughs> is page five can help you give a presentation to your manager on something you'd like to see training in. So maybe you were looking for some PD or even some just paid time at work to be able to learn and do something deeper and develop. 
Um, by putting thought into saying that you've done that assessment and you can tie it to those real life examples. Remember, we didn't just do yes, somewhat and no, but we gave examples of where in the workplace we've seen those skills or seen that we need to beef them up. If we, if we use that self-assessment chart in a different way, it could be a pathway to earn some PD time slash dollars slash opportunities, who knows? So I won't ask you to share your areas for improvement per se, feel free to if you want. Um, but generally speaking, there's something in there that we could dig in and pull apart a little bit more. I love what Stacy shares here about recognizing the impact on others, right? How our own behavior impacts our team and how we want to work to be able to draw out each other's hidden talents. That's like so amazing. And Stacy, I hear you. Like when you're right, right? <laughs> if you have the right answer, <laughs> At least I think that's what you mean by stubbornness. Sometimes we just know. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. So ask yourself when you're presented with the problem, is that actually the goal to solve this problem? Is that what we're trying to do? Yes, I love being determined. It's so great. <laughs> I just hate when other people are determined, Gary. <laughs> Actually, I have news for you. Solving the problem is not actually the goal. That's not what's in front of you that you need to do. What's in front of you are the underlying dividends of tackling the problem. So just like there were underlying things connected with the problem, the many problems associated, there's actually many dividends associated with solving the problem. At the end of the day, those problems you solve in the workplace they do affect the bottom line. That's absolutely key, right? It affects those dollars. But it does have a ripple effect on all these other things. And depending where you are in the company, if you're the receptionist, if you're front of house, first point of contact, first person people see, the voice on the phone, you probably camp out in the good customer relations camp all the time. And that's why you want to solve the problem, because you want good customer relations, because it's connected with your team. Well, if you're the manager who's overseeing safety for the plant, quality and safety is why you want to tackle every problem. And quality and safety is the goal in solving any, every problem. So recognizing that these multiple dividends are not only the rewards of solving the problem, but they're why people will buy in and solve it with us also. So also this, you know, looking inward part, who are we when we're faced with it? Are we running towards the problem or are we running away from it? And it's okay if you're either one of those. One of my close friends is 100% open that they always run from it, they always avoid it. They will avoid confrontation at any cost, even at the risk of losing relationships. They'd rather just never have a confrontation. Well, I would be the opposite. I would pursue a hard conversation so that I don't lose a relationship because I would rather run towards that problem and find out why it is. He's not right and I'm not right. He's not wrong and I'm not wrong. We have different reasons why we're wired into that. So if we know that about ourselves, it changes our behavior and it changes our posture on whether we need to sort of amp it up a notch and find some motivation to solve a problem or whether we need to dial the throttle back a bit and take a little bit slower steps on how we're doing it. And probably one of the dangers um, when you're feeling a lot of pressure at work that things are all riding on you and you're working in isolation, this last question is one that can really trouble people. Do we overthink a small problem and turn it into a large one? And this is one that's best answered in relationship to your supervisor, knowing what is a small problem in your role and what is a large problem? Where are the risks and what parts of it did they really want and expect you to take on? Come on, there must be an emoji that shows how you love this particular slide. I have no idea why it disappeared, so I'm just gonna find it again. <laughs> There's one problem for today, the slide disappeared. There you go. Who doesn't love this question? Show me a happy emoji if this is just a cool question. 
because when you're on a string of bad luck, don't you say the question, what else could possibly go wrong? After like a really manic Monday, that's the question we answer. But I absolutely love this question because this is a great way to evaluate even after we've solved a problem. And this is one I encourage you to just write this in your, on a post-it note and stick it somewhere on your desk because this particular perspective combined with, let's go back to remembering the dividends. If we know that there's multiple dividends on why we'll do the hard work and we go into it with this perspective, this is how we find motivation. So that's our math recipe. The dividends plus the perspective equals the motivation. So hang on to that, especially over high risk ones, because we know that high risk problems are worth solving when we've done the right math equation of perspective and dividends to find our motivation. So hey, we've recognized whether we're a run towards it or run away from it kind of person, there is a problem. And we've taken that minute to know we can adjust our perspective and we can ask what could go right about this? Because usually when we do risk assessment, we only ask what could go wrong about it. Now what? Are we ready to tackle the problem? Not yet. Sorry, we'll get there, but not yet. <laughs> this is another internal question to ask. Is it important that you win in solving the problem as it relates to your job? Or is it important that the team wins? I submit it's always, always important that the team wins. A win for you should always be a win for the team. And I guess there's just a little bit of a need to take our temperature, you know, not the temperature gun pointed at our wrist, but the internal temperature. What's our prickly factor? It could be a real prickly factor. You might be a prickly person. <laughs> or it could be a perceived one, recognizing that because you have high stakes in this particular problem, you're gonna come with all the passion and quote, determination <laughs> to solve it. So we wanna have an awareness to check our prickly factor. Now, one of the ways you can do that is to, yeah, porcupine, hedgehog, exactly. We don't wanna be those kinds, right? We wanna be a little softer when we're working in teams. And one of the ways you could work on this is I know Carrie is working on a introduction or a transition to leadership workshop that's going to launch in February and that's something you can look ahead for um, at some point today we'll put the dates up for you but that's a good intense workshop I believe it's seven or eight sessions long and transition to leadership helps you how help, it's eight sessions long woohoo and it brings you through um, making sure you're not just out for number one and bumping into everybody with your porcupine quills, <laughs> but that you're able to work in community. So that's a little bit of a temperature check when we go into it. And then if you were in our tidbit, we did ask these questions, but I want you to jot them down and work on these um, a little bit deeper. So on page six in your workbook, there's a little bit of a fill in the blank area. To just remember, when we're first facing the problem, it might have been brought to us, but the very first thing we need to ask is, is this my problem? Now, here's the thing. I'm a little bit of a quick problem solver, just from having worked in retail for so many years. You have to just solve things quickly. And when you've worked in food services, you just have to solve it quickly. So sometimes what can happen in an office setting is others might come to me because they know I'll come up with a quick solution and they just want it done. But you have to take that step back and say, hang on a sec, is this one actually mine? It may have been brought to me, but is it actually my problem to solve? Do I just want to be helpful? Was I just caught at the scene of the crime as it were? <laughs> Is it mine? And did it come because someone just trusts me? So someone might trust you because they're in a pickle. Maybe they screwed up a report, they don't know how to fix all the Excel formulas, and they're in a bind because they're lost in their document. And so they need you to fix their spreadsheet for them. Well, they might come to you because they trust you and they're not embarrassed to tell you that they're in over their head. Um, and it's not that you just want to turn people away, but it's recognizing before you turn all your atten 
attention and energy towards the problem, is it just coming out of trust? And if it is, you can still build the trust and redirect someone to another resource that could help them out. Um, or is it coming because of rapport maybe? Or are you just like a super creative thinker? And so you just wanna dive into all the problems and then you don't have time to do anything because you're busy cleaning up messes all the time. <laughs> No names will be disclosed in this workshop. <laughs> the second question to ask is, does this create any fear or ego? I want you to camp out on this one after we're done today. Um, what are the fears that the problems bring up on you? What, did it, what does it bring up inside you? When the problem comes to you, is it that it's going to make you look bad? Is it going to make you look incompetent? Is it going to make you look unprofessional? Um, is it going to expose something you did wrong? Maybe you did an error or you were late for work or something. Is, it, is the problem going to expose that and somehow make you look or feel bad? And conversely, could it somehow make you look or feel really good? And so it may be your problem to solve. And it may be that you're gonna look great solving the problem. And so it just automatically will touch your ego because you get to solve it. And really we get to solve it. That's a great perspective to have on problems. But recognize whether or not it touches ego for you because it's gonna to touch it for someone else. <laughs> so knowing A, does it touch my fears and egos? This is a two-part question, and you can jot that in your workbook there beside that point number two at the bottom of page six. Does it touch someone else's fears or someone else's ego? And so when I get into the problem-solving process, who else am I going to rub because they have a fear attached to this or an ego attached to it? And how many of you have seen, like, show me an emoji that a problem got bigger than it needed to be? because someone was too afraid at the very beginning to ask for help. And so they hid the incompetency or the lack of information and then the thing snowballed, right? So it's very real and we've all been guilty of it too. So recognizing not only does this touch my fear and ego, but who else on the team does it touch? And then of course, who is possibly involved in this? So it's often really obvious that maybe a client's involved or maybe the accountant's involved and right away we can go, okay, they need us to solve this so that they can run the monthly ledger. Sure, but are there, are there more people who are impacted in even the process? So if I do include them or if I don't include them in how we solve this problem, does it mean we could save ourselves from something else in the future or not? Now, I just heard a story this week, and it's super sad. So the thing is, there's this, this crew working in a factory setting, and I got to talk to one of the crew members who did not get laid off from their job this week. And they were telling me about someone who did get laid off from their job this week. And they said, I just can't believe it. He is literally the hardest working person in the whole factory, and everybody knows it. He is the hardest worker, the most faithful, always the earliest, super smart, knows how to fix everything. Why did they get laid off and other people didn't? It makes no sense. And then when they started digging in a little further, they found out that that person was actually never included on a team. So when there were problems that were being solved, people were sort of getting these points attached to them that someone showed up and solved this problem or that one. And because this guy was excluded from those processes, it's basically like his name never showed up in a report. So he's the one there doing all the work and maybe the smartest one on the floor, but ends up getting laid off because there's no documentation that he was a part of solving problems. Super sad sad scenario. And so recognizing not just for the sake of whether someone's going to get laid off or not, um, but for the impact it's going to have on them mentally and in their job and even socially at the office, um, who should be a part of the conversation? And you don't have to know that answer. Here's the amazing thing. You can always go to your supervisor and ask that last question. Because if they have an idea on who should be included or excluded from the process, you'll be working in collaboration with the parameters that someone 
approves of for you. Great quote, Nespa. I love this quote. So unfortunately, I like to sometimes still think about <laughs> the same things, but that never solves the problem, does it? So jotting this down in your notebook and just making sure um, you know not only who is involved in needing the solution, but who's involved in why it was created and knowing who should be involved in making sure it doesn't happen again. So one of the tools, one of the tricks you can use in your workplace, your other free tip, is to ask for your organizational chart and then take the organizational chart and draw on it which problems you consistently face that need to go to which level. So have that conversation with your super supervisor because there's probably some problems that they want you to solve alone. And there's some you want to bring to them. And there's some that if you bring them to them, they're gonna take it to their superior. So you can literally take an organizational chart and draw your problems with arrows to show how far each of those problem solving should move up the chain of command. Of course, to do problem solving, it touches on thinking skills. Now there's reflection questions for you on page eight in your notebook, and that's something you can work on with a team to think about which of these thinking skills are my strengths and which ones are my weaknesses. And once you know what yours and your team members are, you can do that inventory to recognize, here's what we've got, and you have a bonus extra inventory of thinking skills in the outside. What are people saying in the old suggestion box? I don't know if that's a thing anymore. I don't see those around very often. Now the suggestion box looks a lot more like a Google review, <laughs> but we have those outside voices that contribute to our thinking skills to help us think creative, to help us research what the real problems are and so on. So one of your takeaways that you can do is jot down in your book for me on page eight, the things to consider. I'm gonna give you your fill in the blank answers. <laughs> are there existing policies or procedures to consider? Who should you approach about the issue? And then the third point there, are the parts made in-house or from a supplier? Now I give you the fill in the blanks because that activity is something that you can work on with a team to take it as an example and then in the next part of our workshop today we're going to look at those different problem solving rubrics you can take this problem with the team and the things to consider and then use it to work through one of the problem solving skills so there's a freebie bonus activity for you now to be a good problem solver oh i wanted to give you one other thing let me grab this resource for you i thought this was kind of fun when I was reading this, let me paste it here for you. This is kind of a cool little thing. It's somewhat silly questions. They're just brain teasers to help your team think about critical thinking. And um, I just thought it's fun thing for you to take away because you could use some of these questions too, um, along with that one that I gave you on page eight, you could use some of these questions to do the same thing with the upcoming problem solving tools. So what is an ideal problem solver? You'll want to jot this down on page nine, I'll give you the answers right here. Ideally, you're an ideal problem solver. You can, I identify the source and I know one of our chat comments said someone's really good at identifying the root cause of something. Ideal problem solvers also define the context of the problem. They can explore solutions and strategies. They can act on the best solution and then they can look back and evaluate the process and true to Disclosure, I hate the L the most. Having to go back and evaluate the process always feels like there's not enough time for that. But don't just be an idea problem solver. <laughs> don't be like me, be like Carrie, be ideal. Be able to look back and evaluate the process because in a lot of the problem solving techniques, we're really focused on A, 
we want to just implement the problem. But most of the problem solving techniques are actually the E and the L. So you can even circle that in your book, because if you can spend more time on E, you'll do a proper risk assessment. And if you spend a good chunk of time in, on L, in fact, up to 50% of your time on L in looking back and reviewing, then you'll prevent the problem from happening again. So ideally, you want to be all five things, but your E and your L is sort of where the higher level thinkers spend their time camping out because you can evaluate risk and prevent it from happening again. Now, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to take a look at some problem-solving strategies. These strategies are ones that you'll have lots of examples to work through with your teams, and you're going to find something that feels comfortable to you, and I even have a bonus one that's not listed here. Um, but when we're stuck to our computers and staring out loud, we like to have a quick stretch break and grab what you need. So why don't we come back at... Carrie's going to give us a time. About five or eight minutes would be good. So how about 2.10? Perfect. We'll see you all shortly.
How are we doing? Let's see some emojis. How are we doing? Everyone have a good quick break and I'm sure you went and did 30,000 jumping jacks and push-ups and all that jazz. <laughs> Ran to the washroom, got a coffee. <laughs> well, hey, let's look at these methods. There's lots of them and they're, they're somewhat into categories on the way brains think. We have some left brain thinkers, some right brain thinkers. Can we get a shout out for the right way to think? I won't tell you what it is because there is none. They're both right. And we're going to whiz through these, but in a way that leaves you with a lot of fun stuff you can do with a coworker. In fact, at home, if any of you don't live alone and you live with a partner, roommate, friend, um, these are fun to tackle even some of the household responsibilities and concerns. You can, you can map these out with some of the people you live with too. So the first technique here, the questioning technique, this is a great one for especially verbal processors because it gives you a place to, to take the conversation in the proper flow. So by asking a problem happened, what exactly happened? Who did it happen to? Who is involved? Where did the problem happen? And where do we need to go to solve it? Is there a physical space involved? Um, when did it happen? And actually, let's back up to the where. <laughs> That's what I like to kind of circle because sometimes we don't notice that a common thread keeps occurring. Maybe the where always happens in the same place. And so maybe there's some elements about the temperature in the building, background noise. Maybe there are some elements at play that are contributing to problems. So. Don't overlook the physical space, even though it's fun to jump into the interpersonal dynamics um, and the practical needs, be sure to be looking at the context of the physical environment. And of course, the other questions, the who, what, when, where, why, how, and not forgetting the how often and how much. Now here's the thing, don't we all want a quicker solution? We just want it done. We want to just rip the band-aid off and let's just deal with this problem and move on, correct? <laughs> Well, sometimes the people who are in the rush to do that are really only asking one question. They're sometimes saying, how? How do we just make this end? How do we solve this? Or they might be just saying, uh, how much is this going to cost? Or I recognize this problem person again. And so we're focused on the how often. So if we can expand the conversation to explore. Let me ask you a question about that. What was happening that led up to this? Who witnessed the incident? Who was involved? Who was on shift before you? When we start to explore some of the seven questions, it can be a little bit more of a directed conversation. Now in your workbook on page 10, you do see that there's an example of a client filing a complaint with your company because of a project not meeting a target budget. And so there's a, an example of the kinds of questions you can ask, but of course it's not all the questions you can ask, but it helps shape how to direct a conversation with a team or an individual to get to answer that. Now I want you to take a moment here and come up with a common complaint in your workplace. So customers, clients, coworkers, maybe someone on your team, are you always coming up with, or did you just this week come up with a new problem? We're gonna take a moment or two, and I want you to write down your complaint on page 10. And I'll do it too. We're gonna think of our complaint and then just ask a couple of the why the w questions and from there let's let's explore a little deeper on reflection privately but while we're here together let's take a second and come up with what is a common complaint we observe in our workplace
Thank you for doing that. I want to share with you one of the ones that I jotted down. I probably could have written a few about all the different workplaces I work at. There's always more problems than there is time <laughs> to be able to solve them all. <laughs> but one of the ones I notice when people come to my classroom here at Workplace Education Manitoba, we give the address, but the building doesn't really have a name and the building is on a campus with many other buildings that look identical. So the complaint or the problem that I observe is that the classroom is hard to find. Well, this is so simple. We can make a map, right? Does that seem like problem solved? Done. Map done. Well, yes, that would definitely help. However, as I go through the what, who, where, when, why, and so on, let's take an example of one of the whys. Why is the building hard to find? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. It's because it's on a campus, it's because of where the building numbers are and so on. But the classroom is also hard to find because there's so many parking signs and there's like three different levels of parking around here and you have to know which one you're allowed to park in. And they're all different times and different color coded. So this tells me that making a map isn't going to be the only thing that solves the problem, but the map would also need to include parking instructions or the classroom will still be hard to find. So that's just one practical example of how we sometimes ask one question, what's the problem? Hard to find, great solution is a map. But by asking the other six questions, we come up with a better solution so that we don't end up with another problem like now I have your map, now where do I park? <laughs> so um, I do appreciate the seven questions for that reason. Are you comfortable with that one? How many have used that one in the past? Show me your thumbs up emoji if you're really good at that one and you didn't forget to use the how often, how many, how much question when you've used it. That's a good one to just have written up on a whiteboard. You can have that in the corner of your whiteboard, like how a teacher puts um, the homework assignments for the day. Um, have these seven questions just up in the corner of your whiteboard. It's just kind of a fun little thing to do. The measure of success is not whether you have a tough problem to deal with, but whether it's the same problem that you had last year. So we're not just looking at measuring, can we solve problems? It's almost like saying, can we solve new problems? We want to be sure we're not just repeating the same thing over and over. We might have to come up with seven solutions till we find the right one. But if we deal with it in an orderly way, we might not have to keep repeating the problem. So to be a proact to, or to enforce a proact method to investigate. This is just a very simple acronym that helps our acronym lovers of the world come up with a rubric on how they can work through a project. Well, let's take a look at why being proactive matters. Could you imagine, and there is a place to fill in the blank on your workbook, page 11. Could you imagine that reacting costs up to 30% more than being proactive. This is hard to get our heads around because there's such 
companies are run on, under such leanness these days that it feels like there's not always enough time to put all the proactive measures into place. It takes too much time. But if we recognize that you're saving at least 30% in resources, then being proactive towards a problem is better than being reactive and it can save up to four times in wasted maintenance resources. And of course, those um, your fill in the blank answer on the last one is spikes. It causes the spikes in resource costs and employers, generally speaking, want to control costs and know how to plan for future problem solving budgets. So here's your fill in the blanks there for page 11. Be proactive means you've identified and examined a problem. You've determined your objectives surrounding said problem. You've been able to identify your alternatives. And don't forget, one of your alternatives is to actually not solve the problem. Sometimes that's actually a great way to push a team into deeper problem solving is if you don't just go and put the Band-Aid on it, but you leave the problem hanging until the collective comes up with a solution. So don't overlook that one of your alternatives is to not solve it. And then, of course, considering consequences and thinking of associated trade-offs. Now, you do get to ask questions about what kind of problems are facing you at work and whether the PROACT method works with your supervisors and so on. And in reflecting about that, your thoughts about planning, your thoughts about planning really bringing, it's bringing the future into the present so that you can act on it, so you can do something about it. It's like solving a problem before it happens. This probably will find you favor with managers because they like to know that before you even propose a new product or a new service, that you've already done that proact method to think, how can I solve the problem before it even happens? Again, this refers back to how to write a good proposal or a good report. You can use PROACT as the guideline to write a proposal because it shows that you've looked at the various aspects of problems that you will encounter and putting things down on paper is sort of the key to life success. <laughs> Now, beyond that relatively simple method of the PROACT acronym, here's a way that some of your creative thinkers and analytical thinkers like to think. So, who works with someone who's so analytical that they almost can just count everything? They're mathematical in every equation. Do you work with anyone like that? Are you married to anyone like that? Do you have a child like that? <laughs> We know those people who are just so analytical and they can see things in black and white and they can see them in flowcharts. Some people just dream in flowcharts. So the next two ways are things that those an analytical people want to do. And often these type of people want to write something down. If they're analyzing, they don't just want a verbal process. Recognize, do you have the people on your team or are you that person that you like to write something down? Now, this Shikawa method is kind of fun for analyzing. It's really to help you visualize, hey, I've got a problem that would be in the fish head there. And then what are all the contributing pieces to the problem? So there's different categories within the problem. And there's a bunch of things that contributed to having the problem happen. So this would be a commonly used diagram by people who like to write things down and like to analyze because you can also attach costs to this. So if you were gonna fix the problem by knowing all the subcategories, you can attach budget items to it. So maybe your problem this year is that you didn't meet budget. You were over budget on one department. Well, why did all that happen? And you could put all your costs in and all the realities in the world in. Maybe you had to buy PPE and that wasn't budgeted for. That would go as one of the categories contributing to this. And then each of those little subheadings could have a dollar amount. So for our accountant people in the crowd, you'll love that one. If we look at a real life example, um, let's say we're in a healthcare facility and a resident fell and was injured during a transfer from their wheelchair to the toilet and they were they were being assisted by an aide when it happened. Now, this blue box is like the fish head. I know it's a different shape, but this shows you what it looks like in a, in a flow chart. 
And then you can break it down and say, were there any environmental risks? So was there something about the space itself? What were the equipment and supplies at play, the people and their training, and then our rules, policies, and procedures. So that's a real life example of something you could do. Your workbook asks you to do that with a real problem you have. So you could work on that on your own, or you could use that as a, a template to use with a team where you put the problem in the yellow box and you just brainstorm the heck out of it to find out what were all the contributing pieces leading up to that problem. And if you need to rejig a budget because of it, this is such a cool pattern to use. So that um, yellow fish in your workbook, that's the one that you'll want to work through on page 13 with a real life problem that you're facing and they don't have to be huge. One of the better ways to do this particular exercise if you're new to it would be to take a giant problem and a miniature problem. So your giant problem might be that um, there's you no longer have a supplier willing to supply you with X supply. Well that's big. You have to it could affect your whole operation if you don't have that supplier. So you could look at all the contributing factors in the world and chain supply chain solutions and all of those pieces. But then pick like a super tiny one, like ice builds up on the edge of the parking lot because there's a drainage tube there. So pick a super simple one and and break this down with environment staff policies and so on and you'll see that um, one of them is actually easier to solve than the other i'm not going to tell you which one but you'll discover with your team that um, one level of thinking is easier to solve the other one touches you personally so it can be a little bit trickier to solve so that's the homework I want you to take, that you'll work on that not in isolation. Go ahead and do it in isolation, but work on it with someone else also so that you get a little bit more input on how to get more fish bones. Usually we don't want fish bones when we're eating fish. In this case, the more bones, the better. That's our goal. Now, taking a look at the seven ways method, this is similar to fishbone in the sense that those who are highly analytical want a highly analytical process to do. But it's different because it also resounds with some creative thinkers. So a lot of people can see more creative thinkers, more right brain people, they can identify the problem and then their brain goes into overdrive. There's so many solutions that they almost can't solve the actual problem because they want to solve everything else it touches. So it's like a big ball of yarn. I don't just want to wind up the yellow ball. I see that the yellow yarn touches the red and it touches the blue and we just have to solve all these problems. So the seven ways really helps your highly analytical yet creative thinkers. And you'll notice in your workbook on page 14, something that looks really complicated. <laughs> I promise you, it's not that complicated. <laughs> but let's imagine that we have a problem, and the problem is a coworker, or maybe more than one coworker. We don't want to say that one person's always like this. But looking at our workbook, we can see on the first row, we're identifying what the problem is. There's someone who's always late. And going across in that row, we have seven different columns to look at. And we want to identify what would be a possible solution for that person to not be late anymore. Well, maybe solution number one that goes in the column number one would be we change their start time to accommodate whatever it is that's making them late. Maybe solution number two is we discipline them. <clears throat> Excuse me, we, we implement workplace discipline. Maybe solution number three is we sign them a workplace mentor. And we cannot quit the exercise until we've come up with seven possible ways or seven methods to address that issue. Now going below that, we have a brand new problem. This is not related to the first row. The whispering to coworkers or customers. We want to identify that's a problem. And how do we come up with seven possible solutions? And when it comes to personnel issues, it can be 
painful to try to come up with seven <laughs> because often we just want to go right to discipline or right to mentoring and and we're not thinking creatively about other ways maybe you have uh, someone who's always whispering to coworkers and customers and so you have to modify their workspace so that it doesn't accommodate that so those are all those possible solutions now this one um, because it involves so much creative thinking this is a great whiteboard exercise or post-it note exercise where you could have um, a problem with seven possible things put up there and different people contribute to the answers and it doesn't always happen in a one hour meeting. This is a good one to put on one of those giant post-it notes on the wall and people chip away on it throughout the week so that by the end of the week we've thought of seven different things we can do. Now, in your workbook, I did pick on personnel issues. I didn't give you process and factory type issues. <laughs> um, that's kind of on purpose because the other side bonus of this exercise is that it is quite possible that every item on every row is all about one person. And so when we're dealing with personnel issues or coworkers that kind of give us a rub and make our job difficult. It does help when we can break down that instead of saying that person is difficult or that person is prickly, instead of doing that, we could break down what are the actual things. And with each of those seven things, maybe instead of correcting their behavior, I even have seven ways I can cope with it and seven things I can do. So I did want to put one in here that was about um, interpersonal relationships because it helps us see there are several different ways to do it. I love this uh, quote that follows that part because it says, a sum can be put right, but only by going back until you find the error and working it afresh from that point, never by simply going on. And the seven ways method really does that. It helps you to keep going back because you might come up with a solution by idea number three. <laughs> but then if it happens again, uh, maybe the right solution is actually number six or seven. And we just need to go a little bit further down the possible solution journey. It's um, an important one to do with people who need time to process decisions because they could see then on paper what the risks associated are with each of those particular decision makings. That's a big one, isn't it? I just gave you a massive piece of homework there. I recognize that. Now, the one that most people think is fun. That's the one we're going to talk about now because this is super fun. Who's heard of the six thinking hats? problem solving methods before. Show me your emoji if you've gone into this and worked on this. It's super fun. Everybody loves it. And actually a very, very dear friend of mine owns a hat store in Winnipeg. And so I love talking about this one because hats are not just something we think about in problem solving, but people sort of attach their personalities to them also. Something about the thick the six thinking hats that I want you to consider is that this could be used um, for a particular problem and you could use all six of the hats to tackle a problem or any color hat could be used in isolation when you want to direct or even control a conversation to go a certain direction. So thinking about that the premise is we don't want to be confused <laughs> because that's going to muddle down our effective thinking and our effective processing, but we want to have really direct conversations. Now, some people are a little bit um, maybe softer and a little bit more relational, and so they wear a different hat than you wear. Maybe you're a little bit more uh, data-minded and focused on analytics. Well, you're a white hat person and you can't understand why the rest of the world just doesn't wear the white hat. So not only does doing the six thinking hats help us um, see a problem from all angles, but it also helps us understand our team. This, this method could be used just to do team building exercises together. So you would decide in advance 
which of the hats do we want to talk about in which order? And you're setting down a, a guideline for the conversation. And the conversation doesn't have to be verbal. This could literally be, we want to develop a new product. And in order to do that and do our pros and cons, our pro and con list is going to be that we're just going to kick the tires on the white hat, the red hat, the black hat, and et cetera. So if you wanted to see what that looks like in your page 15 table that you have there, I'll make this a bit bigger for you. That whole middle column is something you might want to jot down to reinforce these concepts for you. You can say to the team, we want to look at this problem from the white hat perspective. Let's put the white hat and look at this. Well, in that case, we're being completely objective and we're only looking at facts. So numbers come into play here. The people who love to say, what's the bottom line? They love the white hat. <laughs> and we love having people like that in our world, don't we? <laughs> what would we do without them? Those those next steps of conversation when we say let's put on the red hat and discuss this problem or this opportunity here's where we're touching on the passion the intuition and the emotion someone might just have the gut feeling about why we need to do this they might just have the passion to carry the whole project and they might say you know what guys i know this is a huge risk but this is what i'm feeling i really think we should do this and if it fails it's on me that's a red hat comment and a good way to silence your people who can only talk that way <laughs> and to help them grow in these other ways of evaluation is to say that part of the Red Hat conversation's over. We'll pick it up later, but now we're going to move on to the Black Hat. And the Black Hat is all about caution, pessimism, and somberness. It's looking at the risk and saying, what is the bad side of this? What could go wrong? What happens if we really mess this up? And who's going to hate this? If we do this, maybe it's even your competitor. And maybe your competitor is going to make your life miserable when they see you roll out a product that they're uncomfortable with. Now, no one wants to live under the black hat for too terribly long, right? That's a depressing place to be. <laughs> so then you can steer the conversation and say, OK, now it's time to put on the yellow hat. Why do we want to do this? What could happen? What is the great stuff that could happen if we solved the problem this way, if we tackled it and came up with a solution? What are the great things that can come out of this, including those runoff extra sidebar things that can happen? Green hat. Some people love to live in the green hat land. I honestly do. <laughs> I love to just sort of be like, okay, let's put the green hat on. Let's look at the seven solutions. What is every possible solution? Let's brainstorm the heck out of this. And after um, we brainstorm the heck out of this, we need someone to stick the blue hat on and say, okay, now the discussion needs to go into saying, how are we going to do this? We've taken everything we know and we've assessed the risks and we've decided which risks are worth pursuing and and when so we start to attach a synthesis that usually has a timeline attached to it now one little fun thing to note is that you could in each of these different hat conversations you could employ those other problem solving methods so let's look at the white hat you could say we're going to have the white hat discussion and we're going to talk about the problem and it's all to do with budget let's say well then go ahead and use the Ashikawa method. While you're in the white hat category, draw the fish on what the problem was. We didn't meet our sales objective. And what are all the reasons why? And draw all the fish bones. You can do that kind of analysis while you're all under the white hat. Similarly, you could do it under any other colored hat. Or you could do the seven ways or the five W and two H's. All those problem solving methods could be used in conversation with any particular one of these hat categories. So if you have a small problem, you can quickly go through the six hats around the room, no problem. Sometimes you have to attach a time limit. Everybody gets a minute on each hat. <laughs> Give your opinion for one minute on each hat as we go around. And it's like passing the conch around the talking stick as it were. Um, so setting the timelines and boundaries helps, but don't be limited to only conversation. Charts, 
flowcharts, the five W's, these help bring the exploration to people when they're wearing a hat that they're not comfortable in or wired for. If you give them one of those other problem solving tools, it can really enrich the conversation. How true, right? If we actually know what the problem is, we do have a better chance at actually solving the problem. So recognizing that there is an overall framework for problem solving. There is um, the concept of the eight disciplines. And this isn't necessarily a way to solve problems. This is just a framework that your particular organization might work under in a higher level. So they may look at that there are eight different disciplines that come into play when we're solving problems. Those are listed for you in your workbook, so you don't have to write them all out. But what's really fun about it is you could actually draw a line between the first four and the bottom four. Now, this methodology is really built on the idea that we want to fix the problem and, quote, fix it right, <laughs> right? We, if anyone's watched Mike Holmes, you know th this type of concept to <laughs> just let's do it right the first time. Um, so especially with high risk, high money people involved, we want to look from every aspect of the eight different disciplines. So you can even draw a line right through those numbers one to eight, where this whole plan, do, check, act technique is really a part of the 8D, where you can, after the first four, draw a line. And the top four are really saying there's a whole identification, planning, and coming up with an action plan and doing it. And then there's an evaluation. And so the evaluation piece with this eight disciplines philosophy means that evaluation is actually as important after as it is before. So we're kind of doubling up. We're doing a pre problem solving assessment and we're doing a post problem solving assessment. So there are questions you can ask your team about that and recognize that we sometimes want to put all our time in carrying out the action plan, but almost every problem solving method out there that all the researchers have re released divided up 50-50. You plan it and do it and then you reevaluate it and fix it before it happens again. Remember our question we asked earlier, what could possibly go right? This is that optimist perspective too, that a problem is just giving you your chance to improve. So when you're in it, what else do you need to consider? You have the tools on how to solve it. You have the resources available on how to work through problem solving with a team but don't let go of your values. Your particular company is going to have a number of values and they're not gonna be the same as the next company and they're not gonna be the same as your last workplace either. Because in many workplaces, the customer's not always right. Maybe you have to let them think they're always right. <laughs> but in reality, um, that's not the end goal of every company. Some places put people over profit. So if you're working for an empath-based nonprofit, really it's about people, not about expanding the organization. So recognizing who do I work for? Is profitability, profitability the key? It's Monday afternoon. <laughs> or is it actually about sustainability? So, you know, who, what context am I in? knowing um, what your boss is actually looking for, right? Because sometimes we're trying to make the bottom line happen for them and that's not what they're looking for from us at all and absolutely carry, yes, the customer's right except for the 99% of the time that they're wrong. <laughs> if you're one who likes to run away from the problem, just know the problem's not gonna run away from you. It's gonna be sitting there whispering in the background through colleagues or clients. So it's much better for you to identify it and address it. And then you can let people know when the problem's there and it's not solved just yet. So working together in collaboration 
we want to recognize we have some kind of shared values as a company and maybe even as individuals, although the company values definitely come first. We want to underscore what the actual goals are, and that takes us back to the beginning when we talked about all the side benefits and the dividends, right? Recognizing the root of the problem and being able to follow through on correcting it, remembering the follow through is not just the execution, it's that all our problem solving strategies we looked at also include evaluation and circling back. Love this quote. Working together precedes winning together. Collaboration is multiplication. So very true. Now in your workbook, you do have this scenario rolled out for you on page 17. And what we encourage you to do is to use this as another one of those opportunities with a team to be able to use one of the techniques we discovered together. Now you're going to have a favorite. Do you already know which one you like? Show me with a thumbs up or thumbs down. If you thumbs up, if you're like, I already know I love that one. That's how my brain totally works. Or thumbs down if you're like, I'm not sure which one. Those all seem so complicated. I don't know which one to pick. Explore those with your team. That's why these real life scenarios are there in your workbook for you to take it out and to ask what other things you should consider. Most of us react to stage one. There's an immediate concern that has to be dealt with. Let's deal with the immediate. Literally could be bleeding. Get a band-aid. But why did the injury happen? Let's deal with the root of it. And then how do we prevent this from recurring again? So you may even want your three stages. You can change the wording so it doesn't literally say bleeding. It might say stop the emergency. Um, and that would be a good thing to give some of your entry level staff who at stage one think that they're done. They might maybe mop up a wet floor because someone slipped on something that had spilled, but then they don't recognize to make sure the mop is put back and have stage three happening. So breaking it down into steps for your team can be really helpful. This one, I wish we had um, time to really spend a lot of time in. I want to I do a workshop on human factors sometime because it so impacts who we are and why we make the decisions we make. And so you can do a little bit of research on your own about understanding what's the environment that I'm in right now when I'm making this decision? Are there strategic questions about cost management and the events in my organization and the climate that are affecting my decision-making ability? And here's some really great reflective questions. What would happen if there were relaxed relations between you and your colleagues? That changes the way the decisions are made or not made. What happens when working overtime is part of that environment that people are in? And how does that affect decision making? Interesting questions, because the urgency on how we solve some things is impacted by some of those environments that we're working in. Now, those are ones that you would want to um, take a note of on page 18. They are written out for you in quotations, and they're just things to think about um, in the context of your workplace, because perhaps you cannot use um, the methods to advance on problem solving in some of these environmental realities. Now, at this time, we want to pause. I have a little bit more material for you, but I do want to invite Carrie to join us again because there is um, a little bit of survey work to do towards the end of this. Now, none of us have had a chance to implement anything that we've talked about yet. So don't worry, you're not being asked if you've implemented these things. You're being asked the questions to consider based on what you've learned today and the exercises you see in your workbook, do you think that there's some tools you can take forward in problem solving? So Carrie, can you lead us through the wanna do this survey for us? 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thanks, Rochelle, for popping it in there. Um, so friends, this was the survey as promised. We didn't, we want to deliver on, our, on those promises um, from the beginning. So at the beginning of our time together, we asked you to do a quick survey. We're going to do the same thing again. And like Rochelle said, it's been too, just less than two hours. So we haven't actually had an opportunity to use this information. However, we invite you to click on the link that Rochelle's posted in the chat. Go ahead and complete the quick survey. And we would love to know any feedback you have for us as well. Now, in the future, spoiler alert, you will receive a follow-up call in a couple of months. This is where we'll ask you how you put into practice the, the teachings from our session today, what changes you've seen, and any cool stories. We love, we love those stories that you can tell us on how how we're making an impact, and especially with this, I think, of problem solving. I'm not gonna use the other P word, which is pivot, uh, <laughs> but problem solving can be a pivot point, and I think many of us could attest to that over the past few months, the importance of it. So I'll be quiet for just a moment and give you that, that second to go ahead and complete the survey. And if you do have any questions or concerns, please, please, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up, letting us know that you've completed. Um, we'll hang on tight for just a second while we get everybody else's in as well. And I hope you've been able to recognize um, how we would use these different strategies depending on the situation. And I think one of the recurring themes is the importance of you know, the pre and the post, just like we're doing here with these surveys, um, to always take that time to look back and, and consider what could have been done differently. Some of our problems we're solving are in a crisis or an emergency situation. We don't always have the time for the pre, but hopefully we have good processes and practices in place that, that allow us to, to go ahead and, and make those decisions, hopefully the right ones, and then, of course, looking back. Appreciate it. Thank so you, thank Kate. you, everybody. Yes, thanks. Thank, go ahead, Rochelle. I got all excited seeing these thumbs up. You know how it is with the emojis. I love the thumbs up. I think we're waiting on one more. So go ahead and make sure that you do hit submit at the bottom, because even after you click them all through, you do have to close your survey at the end. They are anonymous. So that's one thing we should have told you, too. We can't see who filled out what. So brutal honesty is great. And I guess one of the things I really want to highlight in the whole survey thing is um, the techniques we've looked at are really about evaluating risks and knowing how to kick the can from all sides and knowing that your process is strong in it. And the more you practice these things, the more confidence you'll have in risk assessment and your own process. 
But there were questions about gut instinct and how you work with others, whether you want and need to collaborate or you don't want to. And those are things that are a little more um, internally just gifted, just part of how you're wired. And so I want you to recognize in those questions that ask about whether you prefer to do problem solving alone or not, there's actually not a right or wrong answer on that. In fact, you sometimes are led to think that if you can just make decisions independently, you're a better thinker. But very often making decisions in community show you're a better thinker because you're able to harvest more input and information from other team members. So if you scored yourself low or high on those questions that had to do with instinct and past history and collaboration, um, just recognize what you think is low might actually be one of your greatest strengths. Now moving on, um, I hope you have a problem solving log that you use. Sometimes you're required to use this in a highly technical field where you do need to log why you did a solution the way you did. If, you, if you're dealing with personnel issues, this is a great tool for you to take away um, and, and keep as a part of your historical record on why things were done a certain way they were done. And don't do them alone. <laughs> I love this. Throw out your problem solving logs like candy. Pass them out, just scatter them everywhere. Because if you can start to understand why your subordinates or teammates solved a problem with certain pieces of information, this takes us right back to the very first thing we talked about. Remember we asked what kind of impediments are in front of us, what kind of roadblocks we can hit, and someone said lack of information. So the problem solving log is what shows you that, oh, I forgot to tell someone about that policy. Oh, our training didn't cover that. Oh, the system's changed and no one actually communicated to them. So the log is how you figure out what a lot of those impediments are. Working together in community is the strongest way to do the problem solving. Now on some of the practicalities of it, um, I just wanna highlight that, um, Sometimes we come into it carrying this burden that we have to solve it. It's on my back. I got to come up with something. But I want to jog you way down to the part that says ask permission. And this really has to do with the solution aspect. Before you necessarily jump in with your solutions and ideas, it's a great idea to work in a community where you can ask permission. Oh, may I share an idea I have? I just thought of something. Would you like to hear it? And that bit of asking permission can be the right way to move people into their different comfort levels with those different color hats that we that we all wear, right? We're all more comfortable in one hat than another. <laughs> so for those like my dear friend that I talked about who would rather run from a problem and lose everything than have to be in the uncomfortableness of solving it, <laughs> our words of inspiration as we wind up is that it can only be changed if it's faced. So that's a good one that is mentioned in your workbook. Give that one a red circle around it, right? Boosting our own problem solving skills, of course that impacts us and we get to keep growing and developing and doing our continuous learning, but it always impacts the culture of our team and ultimately the work and then that public face of our organization. Now this wraps up our problem solving workshop for today. I'm going to give it to Carrie to close, but I know she won't plug the workshop that she's busy preparing right now for you. So before she gets the mic, I'm just going to tell you there is a great transition to leadership workshop coming up that we'd love to have you be a part of. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Carrie, I pass it to you. Thanks, Rochelle. Thanks for your wisdom in this too, and everybody for your participation. We say it every time, but honest to goodness, it's true. We really do learn from one another. Um, as you see our website here on the page, weminterlake.ca, we have a ton of cool stuff coming up in the new year, including a rerun of our HR toolkit, which has been really um, a fascinating workshop for a lot of the folks in it, as well as transition to leadership. So thanks again for joining everyone. Go forth and be awesome. Let's